Catherine is a dark fantasy puzzle platformer and is artistically stylized in anime art form. Developed by Atlas and released on both the PS3 and Xbox 360, Catherine is known for its unique puzzle mechanics, challenging gameplay, and its mature and more serious topics that are explored in the game's story. And I'll be outright about it, the latter could not be more true. There are a few games that I have played that match the level of maturity as well as relatable instances this game offers through its storytelling. Catherine is very much a human experience, which explores the romantic and often tumultuous behavior of individuals. With a heavy emphasis on free will and moral accountability, Catherine starts things off at a place we can all relate to, and at a pace we should all be too familiar with, which for a lot of us is nothing short of adulthood. This review is going to be mostly spoiler free, however I will be providing very light context for the story which would rival that of a heavier synopsis. Let's get started. Catherine places us in control of Vincent Brooks, our disheveled, seemingly absent-minded 32-year-old protagonist, who suddenly and inexplicably finds himself within a nightmarish reality. Have you heard about this scary rumor? They say if you fall in a dream and don't wake up before you land, you die in real life. Climb or die. In order to survive a certain death, players must orient and climb various blocks by means of either pushing or pulling, which helps create paths for the player to make vertical progress towards the final goal, the exit door of the level. Sound simple enough? Boy, are you in for a surprise. Catherine's reputation for being difficult is no joke. If you intend on playing this game on hard, you're in for a wild ride. And it should be said now that if you might not have the patience or the tenacity for it, Catherine can become mentally taxing for some players. And this may not be exclusive to its hard mode. Even on normal mode, this game continues to offer real challenge to gamers by putting them through some grueling tests. Now, Catherine is by no means impossibly difficult, but its challenging gameplay is something to keep in mind, especially if you intend on approaching this game from a completionist mindset. However, because of its notable difficulty, Catherine's hard mode also has a huge amount of appeal for any lover of puzzle games or any gamer who is simply looking for a challenging yet rewarding experience, which Catherine certainly delivers in that regard. And for those who perhaps aren't looking for an overly challenging experience, it should be importantly noted that Catherine is a game that should not be skipped simply because of its difficulty. This is something that can easily be changed by selecting Easy Mode. Because while the bulk of Catherine is indeed its mind-wrenching puzzle platforming, I can say with certainty that the strongest element of this game is its story. For now though, I want to talk about gameplay and what you can expect as you play through Catherine. Each playable stage in Catherine takes place over the course of a night, after our protagonist has fallen asleep. The reason for this, I'll explain a little later. Each stage or night in Catherine is divided up into anywhere from one to several levels that must be completed in order to end that night. As you make progress throughout Catherine, advancing from stage to stage, block patterns will begin changing, gradually spiking the difficulty and requiring the player to either learn techniques from NPCs or develop for themselves certain techniques out of necessity. Part of what makes the puzzle gameplay so enjoyable is that not all of the levels have just one solution in order to complete that area. There are several block positions, techniques, and sometimes just downright messes that can be potential solutions. In Catherine, the player wields the tools. Solve how you see fit. Now, this isn't always the case, as there are some situations where there is only one solution. But I find this to be an enjoyable trade-off of ideas. In the one scenario, the game gives you the freedom of being able to craft your own solution. And in the other scenario, the game challenges you to discover what steps need to be taken in order to solve the wall before you. These two complementary concepts are all throughout Catherine, and often they exist within the same levels. 
Doing this combines both a brain-rattling and almost sandbox-esque puzzling experience, which makes for a fun and memorable time. In addition to block orientation, making progress through Catherine also reveals new types of blocks that begin to make up our levels. Some you've already seen. These range from death spike traps, to blocks that break when stepped on, to some sort of living monster block that seems to have a mind of its own, and much more. The variation of blocks is both impressive and fun. Peppering levels with different types of blocks as we climb higher and higher is not only an increase in difficulty, but also a nice change of pace as we progress through Catherine. And because of the introduction of new blocks, the game never seems to get old, because it's constantly demanding that we change some part of what's already been drilled into us through trial and error to now conform to an added layer of complexity. The game never felt stale for me. Challenging, yes, but certainly not boring or uninspired. And that's a great take on how puzzling should be done. By doing this, it makes Catherine's puzzle system a more engaging and constantly fresh experience from start to finish. At the end of each night, you'll have to face a boss as the final level for that stage. And I'd love to showcase all of the boss fights in this review but I feel that by doing so would be spoiling too much for those who have yet to play this game, as the boss fights are too indicative of plot points in our story. I will, however, be showing the first boss, as I feel this will give you an idea of what to expect without giving away too much at all of the story. The boss fights are very similar to that of the other stages that make up that specific night. The key difference is that each boss has their own moveset and abilities, and use them to try and prevent Vincent from making progress. Some of the later abilities can be frustrating, especially on hard mode, but with enough determination you'll be able to successfully beat them and eventually master them. The boss levels are fun, challenging, unique, and well designed both aesthetically and mechanically, and I'm sure you'll enjoy them just as much as I did. So how does Catherine's handling feel in the puzzle sections of the game? Well for me, controls were always responsive and felt satisfying. I never found myself being betrayed by the controls in terms of a glitch or bug or misinterpreting my inputs. However, on occasion I would experience certain block properties that felt a little off, causing me to get killed, most notably with the trap blocks, but this was extremely rare and so almost omittable. However, I do have one major complaint and one minor complaint. I'll start with the minor complaint first. The camera. Controlling Vincent is a breeze. However, Catherine does not allow you to have full control of your camera. Now this wouldn't be an issue at all if Vincent did not have the ability to climb on the back of a wall. But he does, as some puzzle solutions require it. At times, you will have no idea where you are since you cannot fully rotate your camera. And since Vincent can only hang slide when blocks are connected, it becomes difficult trying to navigate the back side of a wall without being able to see what kind of block setup you're trying to overcome. That alone was an annoyance, but one that I was able to manage with some effort. What exacerbates this problem is where we reach my major complaint with controls, and that is how controls are affected when climbing behind walls. When climbing behind walls, while holding down the left or right directional buttons, Vincent will move as commanded. Where this becomes problematic is when you release your thumb from the directional button, as the controls will now become reversed. I never fully got used to this on my first playthrough, and even on my second playthrough it still confused the heck out of me at times. And under tense, high stakes situations, this confusing mechanic can and did become lethal. If the controls were to stay consistent, the player would not have the need to flip the directional switch in their head every time they go back and forth from front to back. It's most apparent when alternating between the two edges of a block that make up the right and back faces, as a continuous pressing and releasing of the same directional button will cause Vincent to move back and forth. Here's an example of what I mean. I am only pressing the right directional button continuously. This, coupled with the unfortunate reality of not being able to completely control your camera, made for an annoying mechanic when climbing behind blocks and walls. Otherwise, controls were great, 
However, those two issues coupled together in the way that they were is not something that I can overlook. This seems like it could easily have been fixed by giving players total control of the camera or by simply not flipping movement controls when behind block walls. And preferably, both. I'm sure by now you've wondered why exactly it is we're being sent to this nightmare night after night. Well, the game doesn't exactly tell us why early on. When Catherine begins, several adult men of various ages are starting to be found dead by morning in their bed, often horrifyingly deformed with a nightmarish expression on their face. Each case is without explanation, motive, or clue. And as the number of dead men continues to rise day after day, rumors and fear begin to sweep the city. Due to all of the victims being men, one of the more popular rumors that begins filling the air of the town is that all of the men who are being killed in their sleep must have at some point cheated on their partner. This rumor becomes so popular that the strange deaths occurring begins to be known as the woman's wrath. This same rumor eventually finds its way into the stray sheep, a pizzeria where Vincent and his close friends spend a good deal of their evenings hanging out, eating pizza, and drinking beer. However, the rumor didn't reach the stray sheep before Vincent could make the gravest of decisions the night just before. It seems Vincent, along with several others, must now face the nightmare. And with only one possible way out, they'll have to fight for their lives and climb like there's no tomorrow. The other people you'll encounter in the nightmare are represented as sheep. The reason why they're represented as sheep is never definitively explained in the game. But I believe it's a combination of two things. First is that it's an allusion to how sheep are often associated with sleeping, hence why only sheep can enter the nightmare, since the individual in question must be asleep in order to enter it. The second and perhaps more complex reason is that it may also be a reference to biblical verses about sheep being led to the slaughter, which wouldn't be surprising in the slightest since the presence of ecclesiastical themes seems to be a common tool used in Catherine to communicate the many moral dilemmas and consequences that are presented in this game. Whatever the case may be, after completing a level during a night within the nightmare, Vincent will reach a platform where he can speak to and interact with the other sheep who are also facing the same trials. This is also where you'll be able to save your progress. Occasionally, there will also be a larger sheep you can purchase items from that will help you perform special one-time abilities in the upcoming level. These range from having the ability to create a block from thin air, having a drink that can make you jump two and even three blocks high, being able to transform special blocks into ordinary ones, and so much more. These items can be very useful if you find yourself struggling to complete the next level, or if you simply want to help move things along more quickly using fun tools. Some of the other sheep can offer extremely useful block climbing techniques, and often they form study circles and exchange ideas with each other in order to help one another out. It's very neat to see this. Each time you arrive at the platform, it begins to feel more and more like a community. And as you progress through Catherine, Vincent, along with the other sheep, will begin coming to terms with what's going on, sometimes for better or for worse. As a result, some of the other sheep will periodically open up to you, voicing their regrets, frustrations, fears, and anxieties. These exchanges really help paint the grim reality of the situation these individuals, including Vincent, find themselves in. It also gives us a haunting glimpse into who these people really are beneath the surface. And that's because not everyone you encounter at the platform is going to be a good person, and in some cases, it's very far from it. 
The surreal reality of having your life literally dangle from the edge night after night would be enough for many people to reevaluate their lives and the decisions they made that allowed them to be brought to the nightmare in the first place. I was personally shocked to hear some of the more self-defeated sheep open up about their past mistakes and failures. I couldn't help but sympathize with them, as their stories were often not something that would be unique to a world of fiction like in that of a game, but instead mirrored real-world situations where people can feel hopeless or not worthy of happiness in life. The amount of depth the sheep characters possessed was surprising in a positive way and it wasn't something I was expecting out of Catherine. Even something as small as these interactions you'll have with the other sheep helps build an emotionally immersive experience. And it's a breath of fresh air considering there are many other games whose NPCs and characters lack any real depth or dimension, which leaves the player less likely to be able to identify with or relate to them. In these encounters with the other sheep, you will often have the opportunity to provide feedback. How you respond, that's entirely up to you. The final area of each platform is the confessional booth. Walking inside of it will allow us to progress to the next area within the nightmare, but not before an interesting encounter each time we visit the confessional booth. You're here, Lost Lamb. He'll be answering another of my questions. I've had enough of this. A man's worth can't be measured by a single question. This is the second question. Do you feel more anxious when you're alone or when among many people? <laughs> How you answer these questions works in the same way many of the game's other choices work. Each answer has a certain red or blue value, which moves the needle in one of two directions. What the meter represents, however, is a mystery saved for much later. What's really neat about these questions is that after answering, the game will compare your answer to that of everyone else's answer the first time they played through the game. It's a lot of fun to answer truthfully and see how much others differ or agree with you on different topics. I was usually surprised to see the results because a lot of the time my answers differed from the answers of others. And in case you're wondering, I was a red bro most of the game. Upon beating the night, Vincent will wake from sleep, after which the game will always give us one to several cutscenes which progress our story along. This makes the pacing in Catherine perfect, because the only thing that separates the player from making any story progression are the puzzles themselves. This makes Catherine a smoother experience, because you have two elements that are constantly taking turns. One, the challenge of the puzzles, and two, the engaging and entertaining story. But this is not limited to only cutscenes, which brings us to my personal favorite part of Catherine, the stray sheep. Each night, Vincent along with his close friends spend their time at their favorite spot, typically exchanging banter, occasional wisdom, and a good measure of what they're going through from day to day. In my experience of Catherine, the dialogue between the characters at the Stray Sheep is so believably substantive. It truly feels like a hangout, and receiving feedback from your friends feels genuine because oftentimes the advice that's given is logically targeted at some of the more emotional decisions this game will have you make. And when advice isn't being shared, it's usually friendly sarcasm, playful insults, or stupid comments. Nothing unlike what happens when friends hang out. And the excellent voice acting from the characters only helps communicate these exchanges. Exchanges not only with Vincent's friends, but with the other bar patrons as well. After completing the second level, the player can leave the table at any point and walk around the stray sheep. Here, you'll have the opportunity to speak with others and hear their stories, advice, as well as their woes. Interacting with patrons can help the player understand a little more of the strange world of Catherine, as well as its well-written characters. Just as with the sheep within the nightmare, some of the bar patrons' stories can often get dark, yet can shockingly land close to home. What makes these stories so understandable is the same reason as the stories of the sheep within the nightmare. 
And that's because the nature of the issues the bar patrons face isn't something that would be unordinary to the average individual. Instead, they are imaginably socially relevant and believably painful and troubling. It's not hard at all to feel for them. And I was emotionally moved and stirred at times when patrons would open up to me. And I'm glad for that, because just like with the sheep, you'll have the opportunity to provide feedback, either helping lift spirits or dismissing situations that don't live up to your standard of strife. One of the interesting mechanics in the stray sheep is the option the player has of drinking. Doing so will increase Vincent's speed within the nightmare on that particular night. What you choose to drink, however, that's up to you. Are you a lover of beer? Maybe some whiskey? Choosing different types of drinks will offer the same benefit as the others, but it's a cool feature that allows the player to pick the drink of their choice. What's even more neat is that after finishing a glass, the narrator will chime in, providing an interesting trivia point on the chosen drink. I really like this whole concept because it incentivizes players to do what people can go to bars for, which is drink. It's a clever mechanic that adds another layer to the storytelling and gameplay, as Vincent is a known drinker in our story, and speed is going to be desirable to finish levels more effectively. Plus, it's pretty fun to watch Vincent stumble around after getting drunk. Another interesting addition to the Stray Sheep's list is one which you can potentially spend hours of your time on. I'm talking, of course, about the Arcade Machine, where you'll be able to play Rapunzel. It's a game similar to that of the puzzling system of Catherine, but one that's a bit less stressful, as you can return to the bar with the press of a button. Rapunzel almost feels like its own standalone game. It has its own story, unique and challenging levels, as well as its own endings. There is some serious time you can put into Rapunzel. And when you aren't being entertained by Rapunzel's design or its challenges, playing on it can offer some real practice for you when you finally do decide to return to the nightmare. I personally spent a good deal of time on the arcade machine each time I visited the Stray Sheep. That is until I would run out of credits, of course. In quick summary, Rapunzel offers a more bite-sized and approachably easier setting of what Catherine's puzzling system accomplishes, and its cartoony art style makes it enjoyable to look at as well. It's an interesting and well-appreciated addition to the bar that can be easy to get absorbed into. One of the more integral elements for helping determine any one of the eight, yes you heard me right, eight optional endings in Catherine, is the cell phone. When at the Stray Sheep, the player can access and use Vincent's personal cell phone with the push of a button. Here in the home screen, you can save your progress, view and retry completed nights, and view and respond to text messages. Let's talk about retrying levels first. After completing a night, Catherine allows you the option to return to the nightmare if you want to make an attempt at acquiring the silver or gold trophies for that stage. But acquiring gold is going to take more than just speed to earn. To acquire gold, you cannot allow your step counter to reset, and it's going to take collecting as many coins in the level as possible. And you thought just completing the levels was going to be tough. Catherine is going to give completionists a run for their money. But I do believe that the payoff for having done so will be well worth the personal reward and the bragging rights in the end. Acquiring gold trophies in Catherine will also allow you to unlock Babel, an even more challenging experience available from the menu, spread out over four new very tough levels for seasoned Catherine players. Now for the text messages. Throughout Catherine you'll receive texts as well as phone calls and even photos from certain individuals, typically conveying their concerns or inner thoughts on matters that pertain to the events in our story. What makes receiving the text messages so unique, though, is that not everyone who plays through Catherine is going to interpret the same messages in the same way. I know this because while playing through Catherine, a friend of mine was over, and after reading the exact same text, we both had an entirely different idea of what kind of tone it was written in. And here's the best part about that. The game offers you the choice of how to respond to them. Do you feel sympathetic or receptive towards the person texting? react accordingly. Not in the mood for dealing with someone's attitude? Or maybe you simply disagree with them on an issue. Let them know how you really feel. Or send the biggest message by not responding at all. 
it's all up to you. How you react to these messages will ultimately affect how Catherine will pan out for you in the end. It's something to keep in mind as you play. Sometimes you can even receive lewd photos that you realistically wouldn't be able to view if you were surrounded by others. When this happens, simply head to the bathroom where you can enjoy some privacy. I may be starting to sound like a broken record by saying that having the freedom to respond to text messages how you see fit is yet another layering of the immersion this game offers you. It is very easy to forget that it's Vincent going through this story, and not yourself. And on the topic of broken records, here's a fun fact. The music you're hearing right now is not a result of sound editing. It's actually coming from a jukebox in the bar that you can personally control. This was yet another small but positive surprise that I wasn't expecting from the game. The jukebox is a great addition to the stray sheet. It's a simple but effective tool that helps add to the overall well-crafted and, yet again, immersive atmosphere that the stray sheep offers you. There are several great songs that you can choose from, all of which can be heard throughout Catherine as well as some songs from other games that you might be familiar with yourself. Performing certain tasks throughout the game will help you unlock more songs when using the jukebox. I loved setting the perfect mood by playing my favorite songs when at the bar, and doing so helped me realize something about the stray sheep overall. You see, the stray sheep acts as a resting place for our protagonist, where he can relax from the nightmare, drink beer, talk to friends, and get lost in just being himself. But it wasn't long before I realized that it wasn't only an escape for Vincent. And that's because over time, it started to become an escape for me as well. Coming to the bar each night isn't only a method of chronologizing our story. It also serves as a relieving and sometimes much needed break from the often stressful and difficult nature of the nightmare. After playing and completing this game on hard, I can testify that many of the puzzles in Catherine can be brutal at times, and I learned that returning to the bar each night isn't simply a testament to the accomplishment of having bested the previous night. It's also a complementary element of the extremely rewarding nature of Catherine's gameplay. With everything that can be done here, the Stray Sheep truly allows the player to unwind and relax from the more taxing portions of the game which gives the player the liberty to create an experience that is as much fun as it is personal. The Stray Sheep is also a crossroads of sorts, because it masterfully exchanges the fantasy element for realism, while also bridging the gap between the two. It allows the player to experiment with a world grounded in social interaction, for better or for worse, while also demonstrating the fantastical, negative, or positive repercussions of doing so. It's no wonder that for me, the bar became my favorite area. And that's because the amount of tools and freedom the game offers you, while being largely linear, allows it to be your experience, and no one else's. But here's the best part about everything I've just told you about the Stray Sheep. From interacting with friends and patrons, the drinking, Rapunzel, cell phone, and jukebox, it's all 100% optional. If none of these things appeals to you, or maybe you're just not in the mood on that particular night, right from the start, you can get up, walk to the doors, and leave if you'd like to. You do not have to do a darn thing when you arrive here. And in my opinion, that completes the full circle of what the Stray Sheep is aiming to achieve for the player, which is total freedom. Every facet of interactivity within the bar is entirely catered for the willful leisure of the player. I mentioned a moment ago that the phone does a great job at making a more personal experience with the game, and that's 100% true, but it doesn't stop there for Catherine. And that's because freedom of choice saturates this game, and in a good way. I have used the word immersive a total of 9 times in this review, and not because I think it sounds cool, but because it is the closest word I can find that accurately depicts what my experience with this game was like. From building puzzle solutions to problems that at one point seemed impossible, to being personally questioned about some of the most foundational moral principles in my life, to building social bridges with other characters that are strengthened with care, Catherine continually gives the player the tools to exercise preference, while also digging deep into their conscience. 
If you approach this game by playing and responding to each encounter honestly and truthfully as you yourself would, Vincent becomes merely an avatar for your own strange and personal journey. At face value, that statement sounds like Video Games 101, right? Well, I'd agree with you. But what makes Catherine different is that we are not saving the world from imminent destruction. There is no invading army from the kingdom to the north, and we are not fighting the dreaded fire-breathing dragon to the death. Instead, Catherine tells a haunting story about the shortcomings of ordinary people who struggle on a daily basis with their own inner demons and ultimately wrestle with the idea of how much they believe their life and happiness is worth going on for. For me, Catherine became more than just a game, but rather an experience, one of moral turpitude, judgment, and punishment. Catherine creates a conversation that begins to infiltrate the life of the player as they continue to climb their way through the nightmare. This game doesn't only allow you to make decisions, it also judges you based on them. It holds the player accountable for every action, word, and intention, and in the bravest of ways almost breaks the fourth wall if the player should take the time to digest what it is exactly that's taking place in this terrifying story. In every way, those who participate in Catherine are also being tried in the same way Vincent is. By asking us and so allowing us to invest our moral compass into it, the game begins to absorb us into the consequential nightmare that is Catherine. With every action the player makes, they begin to make their own bed. And these kinds of actions are not unique to the world of Catherine, but common in the world we all live in. I am convinced that the more we experience Catherine, the more we'll begin to see ourselves as a result. I didn't notice it when I began, but Catherine very much is a self-actualizing experience, and one that I would personally recommend to anyone who is looking for something strange, compelling, and different. Catherine, for me, gets a 9 out of 10. Its attention to detail to social interactions is not only impressive, but also positively consuming due to the sheer amount of choices you'll be making. The puzzle system is cleverly designed, fun, and extremely challenging. Plus, the amount of optional content in Catherine makes the replay value incredible for how linear this game can be. And the story feels like an extreme amount of time and attention went into making it shine the way that it does. And to top it all off, the freedom that Catherine gives to the player makes it a truly personal and memorable experience. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I plan on doing many more in the future. And in fact, as you hear this, I am currently at work on another game review. So stay tuned and take care.